hopeful to come back to Mexico City, uh, especially uh, just given this course. Uh, uh, Dr. Mendez Rosito has been a, a mentor to me, and so it's it's really fantastic for me to to come back here. And so, uh, so this is a talk on evolving concepts in skull-based surgery. And so I'll talk very briefly about th uh, three different topics. So pituitary tumors, I'll talk about man management of cavernous sinus extension and intra versus extracapsular techniques for resection. I'll also talk about craniopharyngiomas, relevant anatomy and surgical tenets, and tuberculum cell meningiomas. So first, uh, with pituitary tumors, so Ed, Ed Oldfield published a, a novel paper uh, probably about 15 years ago uh, where he talked about uh, uh, the pseudocapsule that's sometimes present in pituitary tumors. So histologically, this represents death of normal pituitary tissue. And so this is something where oftentimes in these cases uh, there is a robust capsule that can be used to help op optimize resection. And so it's not always present and it's not always robust. But in these cases, it's something that we oftentimes uh, look for a as a means of improving the resection. And I'll show my first video here. So this is a 69-year-old female who presented with altered mental status and severe visual decline. Her sodium was 114. You can see the tumor there with significant invasion into the left cavernous sinus. And, uh, and so we, we corrected her sodium. Uh, because of the severe visual deterioration, we ended up taking her to the, to the OR uh, during that hospitalization. So we turn a nasoceptal flap, we do a wide sphenoidotomy, and uh, here, we, after drilling the bone thin, we are removing the, uh, the cellar bone. Uh, we like to see from cavernous sinus to cavernous sinus. We're also taking the carotids here, and then opening the, the dura. And a wide dural opening is very, very important in these cases uh, for setting yourself up for success. And so uh, after the dural opening, we began debulking the tumor. And uh, so you can see the medial aspect of the right cavernous sinus. And uh, you can see the diaphragma here comes into view. And oftentimes at this stage, we'll, we'll try to, to see if there is a robust pseudocapsule. And in this case, there was a pseudocapsule. It was not robust, and it was incomplete in certain areas. So here we're looking, uh, trying to... Uh, to see if there is a, a good plane between the, uh, the pseudocapsule, which really isn't present. You can see the normal gland. Um, now we're working above the normal gland. And uh, here we're using an angled endoscope. And you can see the cavernous sinus on the left to remove tumor uh, from, the, uh, from the left cavernous sinus. And the consistency of this tumor was favorable. So we were able to achieve a very aggressive resection. And uh, so this resection was an intracapsular resection as opposed to the next video I'll show, which was an extracapsular resection. So there was no CSF leak, but we cover with a nasoceptal flap uh, per protocol because of the size of the tumor. And you can see in the post-op MRI that we're able to achieve a, uh, an aggressive resection. Um, you can see the, the enhancing area is the pseudocapsule, and you can see that uh, uh, visualization of the cavernous sinus where the tumor invasion into the cavernous sinus has been removed. She since, she's now about three months out, and she's had, had a repeat MRI, and all of this has collapsed down. The pseudocapsule has collapsed down, and, which is read as no evidence of, of residual, even though there's probably some residual tumor down here. And so this is a uh, uh, second case. This is a 65-year-old female presented with severe visual decline, uh, a very similar tumor. Uh, uh, this tumor is different uh, intraoperatively, uh, though, because this tumor is associated with a robust uh, uh, capsule, as you'll see. And so, uh, so in this case, we did our own exposure, and uh, so we uh, 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 exposed the, uh, the vomer and performed a wide uh, sphenoidotomy using a drill and a kerosene, and then widened uh, the cellar removal. And uh, so the, uh, the, the dura uh, is opened in a cruciate manner. Again, we want a wide uh, uh, dura opening. The, the sequence of steps is very similar to the previous uh, video. So the consistency of this tumor was not homogenous throughout. So the, the consistency down low was uh, more favorable. And so here we're using uh, two suckers, uh, removing tumor from below. Um, and uh, you'll, you'll see later on, after internally debulking uh, the tumor, uh, we advance the endoscope. And I prefer to use a scope holder. I don't like uh, dynamic visualization. 
And uh, we, we search here for the pseudocapsule. And so here you'll see the pseudocapsule and uh, you'll see the diaphragma. So it's important in these extracapsular resections to try and identify the pituitary gland early uh, because there is more risk of postoperative pituitary insufficiency in these extracapsular resection at the expense of, a more, uh, in some cases, a more aggressive resection. So there's the normal gland. Uh, you can see it, the color difference, the color is very different. And so using a Pinfield 4 instrument, we, uh, we dissect the uh, diaphragma uh, from off of the tumor capsule. And uh, you can see this portion of the tumor, the consistency is less favorable than the portion that was in the cella. And uh, you can see here we're uh, uh, using a, a pituitary instrument uh, to, uh, to provide counter, and a suction to provide counter traction. And we're just gradually delivering uh, the tumor from the supracellar compartment here. And so, uh, so that part is removed. There still is some residual uh, uh, pseudo, uh, pseudo capsule at this point. And so we use the, uh, the Pinfield uh, 4 instrument uh, in the, the suction with counter traction and con continue to, to develop the plane in between uh, normal gland and pseudo capsule. And then uh, uh, this uh, last portion of the tumor uh, comes, out, comes out nicely. Uh, uh, and, uh, and so, uh, in this case, there was no leak, so we just uh, cut some gel foam uh, to size, and, and this can be buttressed with some glue. And so we, we did not use a nasoceptal flap for closure in this case. And you can see the postoperative MRI shows, uh, shows a good resection, uh, including the resection of the component of tumor that had extended into the cavernous sinus, and, uh, which was NOSP grade three. And these are the postoperative uh, visual fields. And so uh, this is just an, another case. I, I, I don't think we'll have time to uh, review this case. And uh, so these extracapsular resections, especially in fibrous uh, tumors, uh, can, can be a nice, uh, a very nice adjunct. And so uh, I'll also talk very briefly about craniopharyngiomas, uh, relevant anatomy and surgical tenets. And uh, so just, just some anatomy. We've talked about this in pretty good detail uh, over the past, uh, uh, past 48 hours. Um, but this is a look inside the sphenoid sinus, and you can see the arrow uh, uh, points uh, to where the uh, tuberculum uh, w was removed in the limbus of the sphenoid. And so you can see that the, uh, 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 the cella has, uh, has, ha has, the bone of the cell has been removed. And this is a very nicely aerated uh, sphenoid sinus, so you can see the carotid prominences, and, uh, and you can see the, uh, the bony representation of the optic nerves. And I, I like uh, when uh, Dr. Liu was talking yesterday, he, he mentioned that the bony removal is similar to a chef's hat uh, in these uh, uh, trans-tubercular cases, and I kind of like that, that analogy. And so, and so the bony removal looks like this, and then it's, it's also important to be familiar with the anatomy of the superior hypophyseal art artery uh, complex. And so oftentimes there are three branches, one branch that supplies the undersurface of the chiasm, one branch that supplies the stalk, and another branch that supplies the gland. And so it's very common in these cases uh, to take that descending branch, at least unilaterally, and that allows you to sweep the superior hypophyseal arterial complex north and, uh, and, and give you, gives you some additional degrees of freedom. And so uh, surgical tenets uh, for these cases include uh, transection of the superior intercavernous sinus, and I'll talk about how, how, how I like to do that preservation of chiasmal perforators, management of the superior hypophyseal artery, and attempted preservation of the stalk, if, if possible. In many cases, it's not possible. And uh, so, so this, is, uh, this is a case. This is a uh, craniopharyngioma. And so you can see uh, we're looking again at the interior of the sphenoid sinus. And you can see the, uh, uh, the cella and uh, the carotid prominences, the OCR. And so uh, we use a, a sickle knife to open above and below the superior intercavernous sinus. Um, you can also see uh, 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 intrathecal fluorescein is I, I prefer to use in these cases. And so the superior uh, intercavernous sinus is bipolar and transected. And then you get a look at this arachnoid veil, which is sharply opened. And you can see the superior hypophyseal ar arterial system here. And, uh, and so the craniopharyngioma is visible to the right of the stalk. And, um, and, and so, uh, um, so the, the craniopharyngeum was circumdissected, and then it's, uh, the attachment at the stalk is, is transected. And, um, 
you, you can also note in these cases, uh, so I prefer a gasket seal closure in these cases, and so the amount of bone that's removed over the cella is typically less uh, than in uh, surgeons who, who don't, don't prefer the gasket seal closure. And so the, uh, so the, uh, the tumor uh, is circumferentially dissected and, and then, uh, then can be removed. Uh, anatomically, a portion of the stock was able to be preserved in this case. However, this patient did progress to complete anterior pituitary insufficiency. So uh, uh, he did not develop diabetes insipidus, uh, but he did develop anterior pituitary insufficiency. And uh, you, uh, following the resection, the, uh, uh, the, the tumor is, uh, is removed, and we follow with a, a nasoceptal flap. And uh, so craniopharyngiomas, uh, so the case for expanded endonasal approaches for craniopharyngiomas, uh, the, the safety and efficacy of transcranial approaches are well established. Uh, endonasal approaches previously had been advocated for disease associated with an expanded cella, but we're seeing now that more and more neurosurgeons are, are comfortable uh, removing craniopharyngiomas, uh, even in uh, conditions where, where the cella is not uh, uh, enlarged. Uh, the advantages, uh, we've talked about those, no brain retractions. Uh, you don't have that blind spot that you do with the transcranial approach. Uh, oftentimes there's an improved visualization of, uh, of the interface with, with the hypothalamus, and some studies have demonstrated improved outcomes with regards uh, to vision, and uh, uh, in some studies also the, uh, the incidence of gross total resection. And now, uh, sometimes I will use uh, open approaches uh, for craniopharyngiomas. This is a case from uh, er earlier uh, in my professional career, but by, by and large, I, I favor uh, at this point uh, uh, endonasal approaches for these tumors. And so uh, t tuberculum cell meningiomas, and so that's another entity where it's uh, uh, surgeon preference, where it's possible to come uh, from above or from below. And I'll tell you, uh, before I spent time with Dr. Rosito, I was uh, a little bit biased towards uh, the endonasal approach for these tumors. Um, but I think with time, I've, uh, I've become uh, probably uh, uh, due, due in large part to the experience, I've, I've become a, 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 a more prone to recommend open surgery for these tumors. And uh, so this is also uh, controversial, whether you go through the nose or whether you go from above. Um, I, I think, uh, and so these are some statistics that are presented here from a meta-analysis uh, that looked at uh, tuberculum cell meningiomas, gross total resection uh, uh, between e expanded endonasal approaches and open approaches uh, was similar. Uh, in the, in the meta-analysis that was performed, the visual improvement was higher with the expanded endonasal approaches. Uh, however, the post-operative CSF leakage rate was also significantly higher, 19 percent in comparison to 6 percent. Um, uh, olfactory groove meningioma. So these are tumors I will consider. Uh, my cr criteria for tuberculum cell meningiomas, if there, uh, if there is arterial encasement, uh, I, I tend to favor open approaches for these tumors. Um, if, if, they're, if they're small and uh, especially uh, inferior to the, the chiasm, uh, I, I, will, I will consider uh, endonasal approaches. Olfactory groove meningiomas, on the other hand, I, I think I think uh, at this point, uh, the pendulum has swung in favor, back in favor of open approaches just due to the uh, very significant, ri uh, significantly high risk of CSF leakage. You can see in this meta-analysis, uh, uh, the, the CSF leaks associated with olfactory grooves were 25 percent uh, in comparison to open approaches. And so I, I, I do feel like that the, the eyebrow craniotomy represents a very nice minimally invasive alternative for, for both of these uh, tumors. And so, uh, so just to talk very briefly about transplantum anatomy, and so, uh, so in preoperative imaging, I think it's very important to look at the anterior communicating complex and uh, to get a sense of uh, uh, the orbitofrontal, the frontopolar, the A2s, uh, Hubner, to see if there is any arterial encasement. And so, and I, I do tend to favor open approaches if, uh, if any arterial encasement is, is, is present. And uh, he, here's a video of, uh, uh, this is a 64-year-old uh, lady uh, who presented with visual decline. And you can see the tumor uh, goes above and below the, uh, uh, the uh, anterior communicating artery complex. And uh, I, I prefer a terional craniotomy in, uh, in these cases. And so one of the nice uh, benefits of, uh, is the 
preservation of olfaction. So you can see here, dissecting it away from the olfactory nerve. And uh, so uh, we, uh, following that maneuver, we switched to the, uh, the preoptic triangle. Uh, you can see the ips ipsilateral optic nerve, and the tumor is debulked centrally. And then the plane between the optic nerve and the tumor is uh, developed, and that tumor on the right side, we're, we're able uh, to remove that from the, uh, the optic canal. I did not show the extradural work uh, that, that, uh, that we did in this case, but I know that Dr. Rosito has a, has a talk on that uh, uh, in the days ahead. And so, uh, so the tumor, remaining tumor is dissected from the contralateral optic nerve and then from the contralateral carotid and the stalk uh, in this fashion. And, uh, and it's, uh, then the tumor is removed And so uh, the downside of these open approaches is that, uh, is that you, you, in many cases, you're not able to get beyond a Simpson grade two removal um, just because of the, uh, uh, of the involvement of the, uh, the, the basal uh, uh, skull base, and so which can be uh, in contrast to the endonasal approaches. And so there's the, uh, the post-operative MRI. And so, uh, um, so as a, as a final note, uh, my time's almost up, so I just wanted to put in a plug for our, uh, we have a Goodyear Microsurgical Laboratory, a cadaveric lab at the University of Cincinnati, and so uh, we do host international research fellows, and uh, so if you're, anyone is interested, uh, we're currently accepted, accepting applications for 2019, and so uh, my email address is, is on the slide here. And so uh, thank you very much.